Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It's a great honor to have Nicholas Gonzalez, MD, the author of One Man Alone, an investigation of nutrition, cancer, and William Donald Kelly, and the tropoblast, and the origins of cancer, one solution to the medical enigma of our time. He has studied and met William Donald Kelly, and he was taught and guided by Dr. Robert Good who was an expert in the area of the thymus gland. It was Dr. Gonzalez's teacher. And Dr. Gonzalez is also known for learning bone marrow transport. He's a conventional doctor. He is out of New York, and he is helping tons of people, along with his associate, Dr. Linda Isaacs. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to have the opportunity to talk about our work. I want you to share with the audience the context in which proteolytic pancreatic enzymes, what this whole frame of reference is about, and if you could also explain the metabolic typing or this thing called metabolic efficiency out of which the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the balanced dominance, that whole system arises so that we have a frame of reference to receive you. Oh, sure. The main anti-cancer element of our program are the pancreatic enzymes. Now, the therapy overall involves three components, uh, individualized diet, and the diets range from vegetarian to meat. Uh, we have 10 basic diets, 90 variations, aggressive supplement protocols, but the main anti-cancer element are the large doses of pancreatic enzymes. The third component would be detoxification. Now, it isn't my idea or even Dr. Kelly's idea that pancreatic enzymes have an anti-cancer effect. I mean, in orthodox physiology, they've been known since 1858 to have a digestive function. It was a very esteemed Scottish scientist. Well, he was English by birth, but taught at the University of Edinburgh, John Beard, who in uh, 1902 first proposed that the pancreatic enzymes have an anti-cancer effect. And it was to sum up a lot of years of research and a lot of information briefly, he basically was an expert in the mammalian placenta, which is the connection between the growing embryo and the mother's blood supply in the uterus, and that's how we mammals survive in embry as embryos. And the, that connection allows the embryo to get oxygen and nutrients from the mother and get rid of its metabolic waste. Beard was the first person to suggest that in its early incarnation, the placenta in its early stage, it's known as the trophoblast, is just like cancer. You know, it invades through the uterus like cancer, it grows rapidly like cancer, it migrates through the uterus like cancer, and it creates a rich blood supply, which is angiogenesis, so the beard didn't use that term. He said to the way it looks and the way it behaves, it's just like cancer. The difference is between the placenta and cancer is that at some point, the placenta changes from this aggressive, invading, malignant-like tissue that invades through the uterus to a very calm, mature placenta that stops invading, stops migrating, stops producing a blood supply, and becomes a a non-invasive organ. And he spent years trying to figure out what was the signal that caused this an extraordinary transformation from the early invasive cancer-like placenta into the mature organ. And he realized the very day the embryonic pancreas began to produce enzymes was the very day the placenta had this change. And there was no other correlation it could make with any other system, the immune system, the endocrine system, any of that. The only correlation he could make was the very day the placenta changed from this cancer-like invading tissue into the mature placenta was the very day the embryo began to produce pancreatic enzymes. And then he said, since the cancer is very much like the trophoblast slash placenta, and since pancreatic enzymes control placental growth and determine its destiny, pancreatic enzymes must be the body's main defense against cancer. And then he tested this both in animal studies and with human patients with enormous success. Unfortunately, this very promising non-toxic therapy that was, you know, there are papers in the, from the main, mainstream journals of that day, the Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal, British Medical Journal, reporting case studies of patients treated with enzymes under Beard's direction who had total regression of advanced disease. And even though this is 100 years ago, pathologists knew what cancer was. It wasn't like it was a mystery. They, they knew what pathologists were very sophisticated about what cancer was. And these people were properly diagnosed and had regression and lived normal lives. Um, unfortunately, Madame Curie at the same time proposed that radiation was a simple, easy cure for all cancer and also non-toxic. She was wrong on all counts. But by the time scientists realized that very few cancers responded to radiation, that it wasn't non-toxic but deadly. In fact, Madame Curie herself died from radiation poisoning. By that point, Beard was dead. He died in 1924. And it took just pure chance that occasionally researchers and practitioners like William Kelly would rediscover Beard's work and keep it alive. Otherwise, it could have been lost to obscurity. So Kelly, during the 1960s, 
re- revitalized Beard's approach and applied it and began applying it in patients himself with great success. And then in 1981, when I was a medical student working under Dr. Good, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Kelly, and then Good supported a five-year research investigation of Kelly's results. So that's basically the context. It really develops an interesting story because it developed 100 years ago. It was famed embryologist Dr. Beard. Now, Beard was actually nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1906, not for his cancer work, which was extremely controversial, but because of his embryology research, which is still quoted in the mainstream textbooks today. He didn't get it because he was already so controversial. So it comes out of a very eminent scientific pedigree, and it took people on the fringe, however, to keep it alive. And, of course, we've kept it alive, and we're trying to get the word out there to the world, and that's why shows like this are so important. So the main context in terms of pancreatic enzymes was the work of this uh, kind of uh, ivory tower embryologist, John Beard, working at the University of Edinburgh. He was a laboratory scientist spending Friday nights in his laboratory trying to figure out the placenta 100 years ago. Now, the second component, which you mentioned that you wanted me to discuss, was the concept of metabolic typing, which has become kind of a catchphrase today. And indeed, Dr. Kelly was the person who actually coined that phrase, you know, some 40 years ago, was the the person who really brought that into prominence. It was Kelly's thesis, unlike a lot of conventional alternative practitioners, that different people need different diets, that there isn't one diet for optimal health. And a lot of alternative practitioners, like Gerson or the macrobiotic people, believe one diet fits all. You know, the Pritik and Orners people believe everyone should be a vegetarian, eating no animal products. Or Atkins was the exact opposite. He thought everyone should be on fatty red meat. Uh, the Mediterranean diet proponents say people should be on a balanced diet. You have all these different schools of thought and nutrition, both conventional alternative nutrition, proposing a different diet for all people, all humans, whatever their size, shape, form, genetics, color, sex, um, ancestry. They should all be on the, this particular diet. Kelly was a lot smarter than that. And he, in a sense, helped resolve the enormous conflict that exists in the nutritional world. You know, every time I pick up a nutrition book, it claims it has the answers to what diet and what supplements people should be on, which, of course, completely contradicts the previous 15 best-selling books. And Kelly realized that each, each of these people, Pritik and Ornish, Atkins, the Mediterranean people, had a part of the puzzle, but only a part and that the human species are very variable. We come out of a lot of ecological niches, you know, from the Arctic Circle of the Eskimos to the Serengeti Plain to the High Andes to Swiss Alps, where there were different food supplies available. And in order to survive, people had to adjust to those food supplies. So there was never one diet for traditional cultures. You know, Weston Price, during the 1920s and 30s, traveled the world studying traditional cultures that at that time still existed. I mean, traditional cultures really don't exist anymore. Even the Eskimos are watching TV eating Rice Krispies. <laughs> but in the 1920s and 30s, they still existed. There were these isolated cultures following traditional nutritional practices. And he traveled the world, again, from the Arctic of the Eskimos to the High Andes to the High Swiss Alps to the Aborigines living in Australia and New Zealand to the Serengeti Plate. And he found that Traditional peoples followed a variety of different diets and thrived on a variety of different diets. I mean, the Eskimos were on an all-meat diet. If you think about it, in the Arctic Circle, there is no growing season. There are no fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and grains. The idea of the Department of Agricultural Food Pyramid is nonsense if you're Eskimo. They have eight, ten months of winter. All there is is lichen. There's no, there's no, really no vegetable or plant foods. And they lived on meat. I mean, they were studied extensively. Their diet was 100% meat, 80% fat. Sorry to those people who think fat is the enemy of mankind. To an Eskimo, was life-saving. They, their diet was 20% animal protein, 80% fat, and they thrived. When they moved into the towns and villages and adopted a lower-fat diet and started eating carbohydrates, that's when they started getting epidemic uh, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, even m- mental illness. As long as they followed their t- traditional high-fat diet, they thrived. I mean, the Maasai, extremely healthy people tradition, they lived on fatty raw milk, a fermented yogurt type of milk and blood. The Aborigines in Australia and New Zealand, more of a plant-based diet. Polynesians, more of a plant-based diet. The Swiss Alps herders, they lived on a, they had a very high-density whole grain bread and a, a raw cheese that was very nutrient-dense, and they were in excellent health. As long as traditional cultures followed the traditional diet of their ancestors, they thrived, but the traditional diet of their ancestors varied enormously. And Kelly saw this, although he was not like Price, he didn't travel the world, he saw it in his own clinic in Grapevine, Texas, which is a suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. He saw it in his own practice that if he tried to force everyone on a vegetarian diet, half his patients got sick. If he tried an all-meat diet, half of them got sick, and he realized different people needed different diets. Eventually, he had 10 basic diets and about 90 variations, which was all on his computer. 
and he divided his people into patients into three basic groups, the people that did well on a plant-based diet, people that did well on an animal, plant, animal product-based diet, and the balanced people that did well with both plant and animal foods. Now, there were all kinds of variations.